Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharice Verda, Executive Director of City Building TMU here at Toronto Metropolitan University. I'm pleased to introduce this session today, which is part of our latest Urban Innovation Cafe series. I hope you've been enjoying the series so far. So to begin with, I wanna start by acknowledging that we are in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and to protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. So thank you for joining us for this session about the urban farm at TMU. The urban farm comprises two green roof locations, just steps away from one of the busiest intersections in the country. The original farm on the George Vary Engineering and Computing Center was established in 2004, and a second location completed in 2020 on top of the new Daphne Cockwell Health Sciences Complex. Harvesting around 2,500 kilos of produce annually, these rooftop farms have established TMU as a leader in rooftop urban agriculture research, green roof engineering, and urban sustainability. And we've just put a link in the chat to where you can read all about the urban farm. And I think Claire might even add a cool, really short video. So today we're gonna discuss some of the exciting initiatives that are taking place at the urban farm on the research and programming side related to urban ecology and food sovereignty. But before we dive in, a few housekeeping notes. So um, today's presentation, I think we have our slides for the housekeeping notes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, today's presentation will consist of about 30 minutes of presentations followed by about 15 minutes to answer selected questions from the audience. So to submit a question, please use your Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And if you see someone has asked a great question, please upvote it. The session will be recorded and you'll be able to find the recording on the City Building TMU website in the coming days. And all of our past recordings, including this series are there. So make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter for all the latest information. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce and welcome our speakers. Shireen Shafi is Urban Farms Living Labs Research Coordinator. She completed her Master's of Design at the Ontario College of Art and Design University in the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program, where her research focused on business viability of open air rooftop urban agriculture in Toronto. Shireen also worked at the Green Roofs for Healthy Cities as their education coordinator and marketing assistant before joining the urban farm at TMU. Shireen is a proud graduate of the Urban Farms Training Program. Nicole Austin is a food justice advocate leading Black-centric program development at the urban farm at TMU and also participating in strategic planning with Toronto's Black Food Sovereignty Initiative. She understands nutrition and food as central to individual and community well-being. In her work, she champions restorative justice, progressive urban planning, environmental stewardship, and community-based initiatives upon which marginalized people can build capacity and become food sovereign on their own terms. Nicole believes positive sustainable food system transformation comes through collaboration, knowledge sharing, intentional reconciliation, and the integration of ancestral knowledge from across the earth. So I will now turn things over to Shireen and Nicole. All right, thank you so much, Sharice, for that introduction. Let me get my presenter mode on here. Okay. Oh, it says our host 
has not um, has disabled participants screen sharing. No problem. It should be good to go now. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Luke. Okay, here we go. So let me just make sure it's nice and as you can see a good chunk of my screen here. How does that look? Good? Looks, that looks good, great. Jimmy. Okay, perfect. Thank you guys so much. Hi, everyone. Um, as is mentioned, my name is Shireen. I am the research coordinator with the Urban Farm at TMU. And I'm here today with my colleague, Nicole Austin, our Black-led programs coordinator. And we're so excited to be able to share with you our presentation today, all about bringing ecology and food sovereignty to the rooftops of Toronto. Um, so the Urban Farm at TMU operates two rooftop farms uh, right in the heart of downtown Toronto, as Sharice mentioned. But before I jump in, I would like to acknowledge that we are speaking to you today from Treaty 13 territory, uh, which is the dish with one spoon territory. Okay. So please allow me to share with you the story of how the urban farm at TMU came to be, for those of you who are not familiar. Um, in 2004, the university got its first ever green roof on the newly constructed George Vary and Engineering and Computing Center. So it was in 2005, a year later, that an architecture professor at TMU, uh, Mr. Hitesh Doshi, became the principal investigator for a report that was initiated by the city of Toronto. Um, in order to propose green, a green roof bylaw. So in 2009, after Hitesh Doshi uh, did the good work and the good research to understand um, green roof, uh, more about green roofs, uh, legislation was passed in 2009. And it was actually Toronto became the first city in all of North America to pass green roof legislation, which was hugely pioneering at the time. So this dictates that buildings over 2,000 meters squared must include a green roof on them. Now, fast forward more than a decade later, Toronto is home to more than 700 green roofs, which is pretty spectacular. So in 2010 on campus, some nutrition students got together uh, with a desire to grow food. And they approached university's facilities department who granted them access to space at the ground level to grow. They did such a great job managing these spaces at the ground level that facilities suggested they might be interested in growing up on the green roof. So in 2013, they did a pilot up on the roof and it was so successful that the rest of the green roof was converted into the rooftop farm in the subsequent years. We were very fortunate that this green roof was particularly suited for crop production. As I mentioned, this green roof was initially built in 2004. It actually predated that green roof bylaw that I mentioned, um, which meant it had some unique features that are not typical to what you find on most green roofs uh, today. So it had a greater planting depth, uh, it had a deeper drainage layer, um, and it just was made for the most perfect conditions to, to be able to support the wide ver variety of crops that we grow um, up there uh, as the urban farm. So fast forward where we are today, uh, we're very happy to be supported by the university as a department woven into the fabric of the institution, uh, along with other services such as the bookstore and parking uh, and other food retailers on campus. Um, it's just cool to think that an urban farm can exist along with all of these other services um, as part of the institution. So for those of you who are not privy to what I uh, am speaking about when I mention green roof technology, um, here's a helpful diagram that was created by one of our architectural students, Melina Wang, uh, that shows you details the different layers and components um, of a green roof. So uh, components A to E um, being kind of the most crucial. Um, so growing media, this engineered soil blend um, that differs from soil you find at the ground level, given that it is engineered. Um, so that's what we are planting into. And then you have a filter fabric, a drainage layer that I mentioned that helps to retain water and helps with stormwater management, um, some insulation and a root barrier membrane 
Um, often all, that is also a waterproofing layer that is a, the, probably the most important thing that allows us to, to be farming on a rooftop um, and protecting the roof. So this is an aerial view of the original urban farm rooftop, uh, which as I mentioned was constructed in 2004 as a green roof and was retrofitted almost a decade later to accommodate a quarter acre rooftop farm. So you here you can see our four plot market garden from A to D there. And uh, as well to the right, you can see it says FW. That was the original site of our indigenous food waste plot, uh, which was established in 2021. So as been mentioned, uh, we're also very excited to be launching our new rooftop farm space. Uh, this, this past year was the first year that it was in full swing. Um, and <clears throat> Sharice did mention, this is actually the first rooftop farm to be constructed as a result of that green roof legislation that I was talking about. That, that legislation that I was mentioned came out in 2009. Yes, for some reason, this is the first rooftop farm to be built as a result of that legislation, um, which is super exciting, but also begs the question, why? And the urban farm is very uh, committed to supporting um, the development of more rooftop farms because we think this is kind of um, just a well of opportunity. So not only does this rooftop farm feature a 140 person gathering space uh, and our very own greenhouse, uh, but it is also home to the urban farms food sovereignty initiative. So both the black led and indigenous led initiatives have bloomed in this space um, and it's been so exciting to see, but my colleague Nicole will be speaking more about that a little later. So we are an ecological farm. Uh, there are three primary things I mean when I say this. We don't use any artificial chemical pesticides or fertilizers. That's really important. Um, the other most important thing that we do is nurture soil health. So without healthy soil, we would really be nothing. Um, so it is really important that we do this and we do this by keeping the soil covered as much as possible and by disrupting the soil as little as possible. Um, and one of the other things we say when we're in ecological farm is that we are doing our best to work in harmony with nature, with the wild plants and the pollinators um, in order to promote biodiversity. And some of the production methods that um, kind of enable us to be an ecological farm, some of the methods here, um, for instance, we do a four-year crop rotation. That means we cycle uh, plant families around the farm. So plant families like brassicas, you think of kale and Brussels sprouts and broccoli. Um, plant families tend to have similar pests and disease attracted to them. So by moving them around the farm, it kind of helps keep the pests and diseases guessing and helps to minimize the pests and disease. So that's one of our methods. We use cover crops and green manure, such as winter rye. That's a big one because winter rye, you plant it in the fall and it grows hardy enough that it can sustain itself through the winter. And then when spring comes, it continues to grow and you have this great um, ground cover and soil protection uh, barrier. We use compost and natural amendments, things like chicken manure and feather meal, and we make our own compost and turn it into a compost tea. Uh, we use drip irrigation because it's a pretty efficient method of irrigating. Uh, you have the least amount of water loss because the water is getting applied directly to the soil. <clears throat> we use no-till methods, right? So I mentioned we try not to disturb the soil. This is a very different approach compared to that of large-scale industrial farming, but it helps to protect the life in the soil, which is so important. We use biointensive spacing. So we're not a huge space. We're a quarter acre farm. So we plant crops close together. So this enables us to optimize our space, but it also helps to protect the soil and keep the soil covered. We take a, po a plant positive approach as opposed to a pest negative approach. Uh, so we do this by fostering the plant's natural resistance to pests and diseases. And as I mentioned, we support biodiversity. So we do this by letting a, a good amount of weeds grow it's funny because we say like we do this in intentionally, but like the weeds will have their way. Like you can never stop the weeds. Like that's something that is just a constant maintenance in the garden. Um, but we have a big patch of milkweed that we let grow, um, which is so important because this is where the monarch butterflies lay their eggs. And maybe you have seen that the monarch butterflies have made it back onto the endangered list. So we're very 
very happy to be able to provide this habitat for the monarch butterflies. And we minimize plastic use wherever we can. So people like to ask us, what can you grow up there? You know, like I think they're a little, they're a little skeptical. We can grow pretty much everything under the sun except for fruit trees, tree kind of uh, crops. Uh, we can't support trees up there, but we can grow pretty much everything else. We do focus on high yielding or quick succession crops um, and focus on things that people use in their kitchens from week to week. Uh, so this is a list here of kind of the top 10 things that we grow. Um, but to give you an idea of the breadth of what we produce, we grow 30 to 50 different crops per year and 100, more than 100 different cultivars. So we distribute our produce through a model of thirds approach. Uh, this was inspired by another urban farm in London, Ontario, building roots. Um, and so what this means, this model of thirds, what this means is that we sell um, a third of our produce at market rate for those who can afford it at the farmer's market uh, to chefs on campus through our garden grab bag. Uh, a third of our produce is sold at an equitable or subsidized rate. So this is to students on campus at the farmer's market or at the garden grab bag. And then we are able to donate a third of our produce to some of our community partners. And we're so grateful to be able to do this because not every uh, farm or urban farm could be able to do this, but because we are supported by our university, we are able to do this. And uh, it is great because there is such uh, an immense need in the, in the neighborhood where TMU exists. Um, so engaging the community is another super important part of what we do, and we do this in a number of ways. We've hosted community town halls where we invite participants to engage virtually and provide their feedback. Uh, we've hosted workshops and tours and volunteer sessions we lovingly call work bees, uh, field walks, and uh, as well, we've hosted a training program. Um, as Sharice mentioned, I am a graduate of that program and it was great. Um, we haven't offered it for the last couple of years, but we will be offering it again, if not the, in the year to come, the following year. So my favorite slide. Uh, rooftop farms offer a whole host of benefits beyond some of the most obvious. Um, I think when most people think of a green roof, they think of stormwater management or um, maybe reduced food miles comes to mind or reducing the urban heat island effect uh, or providing insulation for uh, the building below lessening energy demands. Uh, but there are truly so many ecosystem services provided by a rooftop farm, some that are harder to quantify quantify, <clears throat> such as serving as a space for community cohesion, uh, creating habitat, supporting biodiversity, uh, not to mention all the mental health benefits that are gained through participants being able to come and connect uh, with nature. The list goes on and on, but the urban farm at TMU is committed to supporting research to better understand and quantify these benefits in order to communicate the true value of these kinds of rooftop farming spaces. We hope to, uh, we also hope to inform policy development and the creation of guidelines so that we can see this model adopted more prevalently. So research is my primary area of focus on the farm. Um, the urban farm established itself as a living lab in 2019 in order to bring together urban farmers, community partners, and academics through interdisciplinary research on the rooftop farm. The Living Lab builds on user-driven research needs that respond to the challenges of designing and operating a rooftop farm using green roof technology. So some of the research projects we've supported in the past have to do with monitoring some of the benefits that I mentioned of a rooftop farm. Um, so some of the benefits that have been monitored uh, are the ability of a rooftop farm to mitigate urban heat island effect and to manage stormwater. So we had a PhD student who was comparing uh, the rooftop farm's ability uh, to manage stormwater and mitigate urban heat island effect compared to a conventional roof, compared to a conventional green roof. So it was a really cool comparison that uh, this PhD student Tamar al had done. And his research showed that 80 to 88, sorry, 85 to 88 percent of stormwater uh, was retained on site um, by the urban farm. And uh, peak delay um, of the stormwater reached up to eight hours. So this greatly reduce, reduces the demand on municipal sewer systems, ultimately helping to keep our sewage, uh, sewage out of the local bot water bodies, which is a huge concern, right? 
So it is this kind of real world evaluation that is necessary to determine the true value of rooftop farming to support the development of more rooftop farms in Toronto and beyond. So we hope to support more valuable research such as this in the years to come. All right, I will pass the mic. My email's at the bottom there in case there's any keen interest uh, researchers on the line, but I will pass the mic to, to Nicole here. Oh my goodness, I had too many tabs open. Sorry about that. Um, so thanks very much, uh, Shireen. Um, I hope everyone learned something new and uh, is excited about what we're doing uh, up at the farm. So, <clears throat> um, so I want to thank everyone for being here as well, because for me, this work is uh, really important and I'm very honored to be doing it. Um, and so I'm here talking about uh, a relatively new pilot program called that I've called the Harvest Collective and Learning Circle, and it is a Black Food Sovereignty Initiative at the Urban Farm. Um, so I like to tell this story because I think um, it really shows how things can evolve and grow um, with some good teamwork and, and some good ideas. So in the strange year that was 2020, um, I completed my degree in nutrition and food here at TMU, and uh, during that time, I also worked at the Center for Studies in Food Security, um, and it was through the work at the center that I met the urban farm team, for one, because we shared an office, but it was also where I started working with um, the, um, on the strategic planning team with Black Food Sovereignty Toronto, and it was also the first time that I ever gardened or planted food at all. So this photo you see of me here is uh, me up at African Food Basket, which is at uh, Black Creek Community Farm at, uh, up at Jane and Finch. And this is where I uh, first learned how to plant garlic um, with, from one of my mentors, Ananda Loli. Um, and so I'm just really grateful and humbled to be doing this work because it's dedicated to improving our food systems uh, from the foundation of food security, food justice, food advocacy, and food sovereignty mobilization. Uh, so therefore, a key goal of the program is to develop rich programming that amplifies Black food sovereignty awareness and participation and ensures that the farm is an inclusive space for the Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, and also the LGBTQ2 spirit communities as well, so as inclusive as possible. Um, so um, I... I I think food sovereignty is a newer term. And so what I'm trying to do is sort of do that knowledge mobilization about, around what it really is. So I think that we're familiar with food security, the term food security, um, but food security is when communities are free to shape their own food systems because food can be a vehicle for justice, health and sustainability for everyone. Um, so that sort of uh, the, the food security uh, piece but then when you get into what food sovereignty is, and I like to actually um, tease that it's pronounced sovereignty. I've heard people pronounce it all sorts of ways, but it is a mouthful. But basically that's everyone's basic right to food that is decent, healthy, and culturally appropriate, produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods, um, and their right to define their own food system, food and agricultural systems, um, to obtain fair access to resources so that they can advance their own food security. So it's a little bit deeper and a little bit more um, um, holistic, if you will. So um, in terms of at the community level in action, uh, Black food sovereignty is many things. It's dynamic and evolving. But at its core, it's about repairing and rebuilding a food system in which Black people are empowered to self-advocate for our right to healthy, affordable food, reclaim and celebrate our rich food heritage, have, and have equitable access to resources, and build capacity to become food sovereign on our own terms. As you heard in my bio, this is really important to this work. So there have been many uh, key milestones over the past three decades here in the GTA, but some very important ones during these times of reckoning include um, that the uh, BFST um, has been working across the African, Caribbean, and Black uh, 
um, of African descent communities or the ACB communities to um, conceptualize, organize, and mobilize a Black food sovereignty plan in action. So a big victory came in the fall of 2021 as a result of a partnership between the City of Toronto Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit or the CABR unit and the BFST when City Council unanimously approved Canada's first Black Food Sovereignty Plan for Toronto to respond to the need for immediate and comprehensive action to address the problem of food insecurity experienced by too many Black Torontonians and Canadians. So to ensure that the continuity and impact of the plan, um, it was granted a $5 million budget um, that can be used to strategically implement the plan over the next five years. So this is really um, just like the farm and the work that it did with the Green Roof Bylaw. This work is very pioneering. It's the first of its kind in Canada. So it's um, pretty um, humbling to be a part of it. And so, um, the Harvest Collective and Learning Circle, the program at the farm, again, it, it was a pilot program um, that started in 2021, uh, or yeah, 2021, yeah, we're almost at the end of 2022. And um, basically um, it's about the black community and it engages the black community and our allies via uh, four key pillars of the program, um, which are uh, food literacy, food and social justice, environmental stewardship and community healing. And so these pillars provide a framework and allow for dynamic programming um, because the GTA is uh, the home to Canada's largest black population and represents a huge diversity of ethnicities and foods. So the Harvest Collective will aim to provide opportunities for black leadership in urban agricultural and advanced food justice, food sovereignty, health and social enterprise in the Black community. And it's to promote awareness and inspire critical dialogue around what these things are um, and be an inclusive and respectful environment to create opportunities for networking, relationship and community building. Um, and so um, just switching forward here, and I was on the wrong slide, I just realized. So this is grounding what I just said, my apologies. Um, and so the motto of this program is more than a bag of food um, because we wanna really, um, uh, for the program to be known uh, to address food insecurity, inadequate access to nutritious, affordable food or culturally appropriate foods. And uh, this year we launched the program and it aims to engage black youth, students, faculty, staff on campus and the community at large uh, to this work. And really it's to use the urban farm as an incubator space for participants to build knowledge and skills that are garnered through the lens of sustainable ecological urban agriculture. So obviously the urban farm cannot be, um, you know, solve food insecurity in and of itself. But what excites me about it is that it can be a space that is a conduit of learning and discovery that empowers participants to get actively involved in improving their communities via a biophilic design approach um, to create closer connections to nature through the way buildings and landscapes are created. Um, and so this is why I think it's um, really exciting to be part of this series because I think it can be really innovative in uh, future city planning and development. Um, so I hope that it is an initiative that can expand ecologically sound urban agriculture to create a sense of harmony between the urban landscape and the natural world. So a key element of the program is knowledge mobilization on topics such as Black food history, the positive uh, contributions Black people have made to our food system, and to engage participants via food production. So we cover a range of topics uh, via experiment, uh, experiential learning opportunities. And we um, want to uh, teach people about the full spectrum of food procurement and production. So um, in breaking down those four key pillars, um, pillar one is food literacy. And so this is where we can explore topics uh, such as why does access to fresh culturally significant foods matter, uh, youth and student food skills, such as heritage cooking, smart shopping and meal planning on a budget, health and nutrition, 
food as medicine and uh, the Canada's food guide literacy. Um, the next pillar, uh, which is pillar two, food and social justice, is an important one uh, where because we can um, have conversations about food policy and food advocacy and how equi economic equity is essential for food security and empower folks to advocate for themselves and their communities for their right to healthy, affordable food. Um, but also get involved in breaking down barriers to access resources like land and financial capital. Pillar three, environmental stewardship. Um, I think the urban farm is really an ideal space to engage in the, uh, engage the community in topics uh, uh, such as environmental stewardship. And so what this means uh, to me and the program is environmental knowledge mobilization. It can lead to environmental healing. And this is really important and exciting to me as the possibility to expand green roof farming in the GTA, I feel um, have so far been really under leveraged. And you heard Shireen talking about um, the DCC farm space being the first purpose built rooftop farm. So I think that there it's uh, kind of exciting uh, to see what the possibilities in the future are to uh, perhaps expand uh, green roof farming or, or, or urban farming because a lot of marginalized communities are in these high rise concrete jungles. So I think um, there's some exciting opportunities there and I hope that people can be inspired through the program. Um, and so, uh, yep, next slide is pillar four, community healing. So this is essential as it's about engaging through food um, and championing inclusivity, equity, and diversity, and also cultivating of knowledge reclamation, a sense of belonging, uh, self-empowerment, and community mobilization as we work together to confront anti-Black racism. One thing that's important uh, with this program is that it takes a 3B approach and that means uh, Black-led, Black-mandated, and Black-serving. So Black-led means the program direction starts with us so that we can see ourselves reflected in spaces that we've historically been underrepresented. However, it's integral that the work is grounded in collaboration with the ACB community and the Black Food Sovereignty Toronto Plan, as it's important that it is, um, it is important that it and the institution that the farm is situated uh, in are accountable to ensure that we are, uh, the work that we contribute is not appropriated or tokenized. To help me with that, I've established an advisory team consisting of a senior and junior community advisor and a TMU senior and junior student advisor. Black mandated means programming is black centric and focused on developing partnerships not just within the Black community, but connecting us with many others as well. Black serving means we welcome Black students, youth, community and faculty and staff to the farm to engage and learn together. However, this is it, what's important to understand about this 3B approach. It does not mean we're working in isolation. It does not mean we're working in segregation because that's exactly what we're trying, some of the, the, the barriers we're trying to break down. But it does mean that we were, our work is intentional, direct, functional, and purposeful to ensure Black people's contributions are not minimized, discredited, overlooked, tokenized, or appropriated. So this pro program cannot be segregated, and it's essential that it's collaborative um, with a variety of disciplines, um, researchers, and other people, and not just about people being intimidated or apologetic, but in joining us in learning, sharing, and celebrating black culture, black culture through food. So it's actually the 3B approach is a positive thing. And so when I first joined the farm team in 2021, I had never farmed before, as I mentioned, other than planting some garlic. Um, and so one of the first decisions I made was to grow culturally significant uh, crops. And so I was inspired by the powerful symbolism and wise growing practices that the Indigenous Three Sisters crops represent. So one of the first things that um, I decided was to grow crops that are in, uh, significant to the ACB community. We successfully grew crops that represent um, foods that have African roots and that are enjoyed throughout the African diaspora. Um, and these crops, excuse me, these crops included um, 
uh, garden eggs or African eggplant, uh, which makes a beautiful creamy dip, really delicious. Uh, we grew kaolu, which is a very lush um, leafy green, similar to spinach that just keeps on giving. Grew some okra. I was obsessed with pickled okra last year. And bitter melon, which in the Caribbean, or at least in Jamaica, the Patois word is called syrupy. Um, we use it to make a type of bush tea that's very powerful plant medicine. And then in um, uh, this season, um, I decided to expand what I was doing because we then had the new farm on DCC. And so the space you see in the photo on the left is what the DCC looked like um, before we started growing food. And you can see here that it's covered in sedums, which Shireen mentioned is a common choice to meet the minimum of the green roof bylaw. But on the right is another photo of the learning circle. Um, and you can see that it's in a mandala garden formation. And um, this is the space that is dedicated for the learning circle. And so one thing to note about um, mandala garden design, it's there's many types of, of a uh, way to design a garden. And so instead of doing uh, your traditional production rows, I wanted this space to have pathways that people could get right into the plants and really enjoy them, smell them, touch them, um, and, and really immerse themselves in the space. And so that was why I, I chose that design. And we grew culturally significant crops that we grew in 2021, but I expanded it. So I um, this year I included Jamaican pumpkin, and that was the star this year. We harvested about 150 pounds of Jamaican pumpkin, um, and then I also added the um, to the medicinal plants. So I grew some thyme, fever grass, which many of you might know as lemongrass. And next year I'm also going to be growing something called Roselle hibiscus which is full of nutrients and antioxidants. And in the Caribbean, we make it into a beautiful, tasty beverage called red sorrel. So um, this season, students and youth were up there uh, and community were up there participating um, in the project. And they played a vital role in shaping what I think the future of the program is going to be based on what they saw their goals and needs and priorities are in their own unique communities. So I got a lot of really great feedback and this is an integral part uh, of the program to me so that we can foster trust and strong relationships between the urban farm and allies of this work and promote positive change for uh, the Black community that we serve. Um, and so, um, yeah, the whole idea is that it's exclusive for um, our communities and allies of this work. And so I, I do like to really um, highlight at this point that to me, it's collaborations really matter. I don't want this work to get lost in a, si a silo of any kind. Um, so I like to take a moment to, um, you know, throw out an invitation to collaborate. So we welcome guest speakers and facilitators, Black graduate students. Um, and uh, we're very open to uh, research proposals and ideas. Um, and as mentioned earlier, I would love to be able uh, to develop um, some kind of guideline so that perhaps people um, can be inspired to expand rooftop farming in their own communities, especially the city's neighborhood improvement areas. And um, I think that collabor collaborations with um, uh, people is how, and experts is how we could really um, manifest this into uh, reality. And so, um, as I said earlier, this program could be a conduit, conduit to help amplify and strengthen Black food sovereignty engagement and activities uh, beyond the campus by intentionally engaging in uh, the participants uh, via the urban farm. And I really want to see these ideas nourished um, and that these relationships and collaborations go, grow uh, in keeping with the three the approach. It's going to be vital for its success. And so that brings me to the end of my uh, uh, conversation with you. Um, again, I hope that you've uh, learned something new and I welcome you to get in touch with questions or keep stay tuned next year when we are launching a new round of programming. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Nicole and Shireen. This was amazing. I have so many questions. Um, we have some questions from the audience, but I'm, if it's okay, I wanna ask you each a question first. Um, 
just so inspiring. And between the two of you, you've just covered like the whole like kind of range and ecosystem of what food is like from the, how you grow it sustainably um, to nurturing like entire communities and creating like food security. So this is just so amazing. And I love how it's all happening just on our roof. <laughs> so um, first over to you, um, Nicole. Um, you mentioned there's so much in your presentation, but you mentioned with your Black Farming um, Sovereignty Plan in Toronto and a um, $5 million budget over five years. I'm curious how you're going about identifying sort of priority neighborhoods. Um, and if you're looking at like a specific number or if you're trying to achieve a certain number of farms that you can get happening in those neighborhoods, um, within existing um, neighborhoods, you said like high rises and concrete jungle, and there's a lot of these like rental apartment buildings um, that could be, I'm wondering if any of them are suitable for this type of rooftop farming, and then how you're looking at um, future development. Um, we know that the city and the province has have very strong, like high goals for building new housing, and how um, how this program can work with the development of new affordable housing. Okay, so to unpack, um, you said that's a loaded question, but I think I got it. So first of all, it's called the Black Food Sovereignty Plan. Um, and what, the way the plan, the, the idea to is to engage community in the conversation, because this is not about the people who are planning, the initial planners, it's about engaging uh, diversity of communities in the ACB community. And so it's not just about farmers, actually. So that's something that's worth noting. Um, it's about actually engaging in Black business owners, uh, uh, you know, whether uh, Black lawyers, people who are involved in food policy, um, all kinds of people and different professions so that we can come up with a plan that actually serves community, especially the marginalized communities. And so, um, one of the things that we're doing, because it's just started, this is brand new, the plan was only adopted in October of um, 2021, uh, we started off by having a, an initial community conversation, and during that time we were just sort of uh, trying to get people familiar with the terminology of Black food sovereignty, and then a couple of weeks ago we had the second community conversation, and this one was actually a series of questions broken down by different industry, if you will. So for example, I was in the breakout room for nutrition and food. There was a farming one, there was a business one, there was a restaurateur breakout room. And that's where we had a list of questions so that we could hear what the community would like to see come out of this plan, when and how. And then actually this Saturday, we are having conversation number three. And this is again to, to get further feedback from community um, with the CABER unit who is uh, fostering this budget. And so that each year we're setting certain goals that the community helps us to set and then try to implement those goals. And then a year later, see how we did and have some metrics to see how this plan is actually getting implemented. And so in terms of development and rooftop farms, one thing that, it, you know, it's exciting because, you know, many neighborhood improvement areas are concrete jungles. Um, unfortunately, a lot of new developments that are other buildings or condos, which have restricted access to roofs. So the idea is that it's, they're inclusive, that they are these spaces that communities can enjoy. However, a limiting factor might be if they're older buildings, their weight uh, bearing capacity. So that would be where these experts can come in and perhaps use some of this budget to do some research to see what buildings might be able to be converted. And then what is required to have a, say, a rooftop farm in any new developments. So hopefully I answered your question. You're on mute, Cherise. Uh, yeah, that's super. That's great. Um, there's a bunch of questions from the chat. So I'm not going to ask my second question. I'm going to get straight to um, there's a couple. Um, let's see. A two part question. We'll start um, with is. Um, roof is urban rooftop farming preferable to all under glass greenhousing? I mean, that's a big, broad question. And then I guess a second part of that question is, is 
like the traffic for supplying materials and harvesting crops conducted during off hour elevator usage. So two part question is like, how does it compare to what happens in greenhouses? Um, I guess in terms of yields um, and diversity of crops and when you can grow it, but then also how do you um, get the goods up and down the buildings? You wanna take that one, Shree? Yeah, sure, Nicole. Um, yeah, I guess Dan's first question about is it preferable all under glass is it's hard to pinpoint if Dan is referring to yield uh, or growing season extension or because then there's also a factor of um, it, environmental benefit, um, which is the reason why we it is not the focus of the urban farm. The urban farm is an open air uh, farm using green roof technology. So we uh, are not uh, primarily a greenhouse production farm, although we do have a green, a small greenhouse, as Nicole mentioned, it's uh, just being finished, uh, the construction is just being finished right now, which is great, which is optimal, it allows us to start our seedlings inside, um, get a head start on the growing season, um, you know, in March, so that we're, or, or April, so that we can plant out in the field, you know, early May, um, and get the most of it out of our growing season. Um, yeah, it's you when you are farming in a greenhouse year round, you have the there's no limitations of the growing season. And uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not super familiar, but I think they can grow all year round because they have a controlled environment, which is which is pretty great. But the downside is that it is also very resource intensive. Um, from my understanding, it requires, um, you know, a lot of electricity to run uh, all the lights that are required. Um, most farms like that are hydroponic. Uh, meaning they are soilless systems where the nutrients are cycled through the system, like they're artificial nutrients that are cycled through the system. Um, so they are, these systems are resource intensive in that way, um, but they do provide, um, you know, a number of benefits in terms of being able to supply food year round. Um, and I'm not sure they can grow the variety of things that we can grow. Um, I've seen a lot of greens being grown in the system. Microgreens can be grown in this way. Um, I think they're starting the range of what they can grow is expanding, um, you know, berries and, and uh, I'm not sure how the root crops are doing yet, but um, you have to weigh, you know, what are the goals of what you're trying to do for the kind of operation that we are, uh, that we're, you know, um, a campus farm, our, pri I, our priorities are engaging the community, engaging students, being able to conduct research, welcome people into the space um, and provide these ecosystem services. Those are our priorities. So I would say it's not preferable in our regard, but it is nice to have a small greenhouse so we can get our, our seeds uh, seedlings started. The other question about the off hour elevator usage. Uh, no, we do not uh, solely use the elevator in off hours because we have to harvest, uh, we harvest three days a week and we harvest first thing in the morning so that the crops are harvested fresh that day and we have to get them where they're going. Uh, you know, it's, uh, they are perishable goods. Uh, they wilt fast. Um, and so we wanna make sure we're getting this, this, this fresh nourishing food to people as fast as we can. So that is not our priority is using the elevator in off hours, but it is a good thought because, you know, um, having, a rooftop farm that has access to like some kind of freight elevator that comes to the roof um, is ideal so that we are not having to use the um, passenger elevator and have to be in the way of people like in the building uh, during the day um, because the mechanical elevator tends to not have as much traffic anyway. So I hope that answers that. Great. We've the got only thing I would add really quickly though is uh, there was a big, huge missed opportunity with the DCC development where there is uh, the freight elevator is is the shaft finishes on the roof, but they didn't give us access. So a bit of a missed opportunity, you know, so that's why with what Shereen was saying, it is really um, in the design to have a freight elevator ideal because we have one on one roof and then the other we don't. So oh, that's interesting. Um, where all I the just, students are living, you know? Uh, who, who, yeah, who that's super, super interesting. Uh, there's one question that I'm hoping you can ask really quickly um, because there's a number of other questions, but it feels like it's um, it kind of builds on the question about productivity. It's simply asking, what is the extension of the growing season on a rooftop farm? If so that, so um, I think their question is asking if we have if our season is naturally extended, just given that we are on a, on a rooftop? I think that's the question. And um, the answer is yes, just a bit. We have about a week 
an extra week on each end because it tends to be a bit hotter up on the roof. So we tend to have a, a, an extra half a month, I guess, in the growing season, uh, if that's what they're asking. Oh, that's really interesting. Good to know. And James is asking about weeds, wondering, you know, because a lot of them are delicious and edible, as you know, and nutritious. Um, so any attention being given to cultivating and raising awareness about edible weeds? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm glad you asked that question, James. I know that you're an avid gardener yourself. Um, but yeah, so what the way like people call weeds weeds and they see them as being uh, pests but one thing and this would tie into Andrea's question by the way hi James hi Andrea this would maybe tie into Andrea's question about Indigenous engagement on the DCC roof so um one of the things our colleague Samantha the Indigenous led program coordinator is doing is actually she has uh, planted all of her spaces with just native Ontario or Canadian plants and a lot of them might be things that people would consider uh, might be weeds when you're growing food. But actually, um, once you start learning about what's what and what you can eat or use medicinally, even um, you can see that there's really no such thing as weeds. But I guess when you're growing food, you don't want the food to compete with you know, these weeds. So we do do all manually, uh, we do remove weeds, but not all of them. And we definitely um, have nibble on lots of different weeds. What's the one, the purse, is it purslane shireen that is really nutritious and delicious? Yeah, I would love to add to what you're saying, Nicole, um, because we, um, like a lot of things that just grow naturally are these like super nutritious and delicious things. So we do, when we bring people on tours, one of my favorite things to do is to make eat, people eat purslane. Uh, that's the, the weed that Nicole uh, was talking about. But this term of like weeds is like so, um, it's like made up, you know, like what is a weed? Like this is super delicious, nutritious, uh, vigorous plant. Um, but so we started, um, we have an apprenticeship program with our students in the summer. This is a new program that we just launched where we have five students working with us. They do a classroom learning module every week. And so one of the uh, learning modules that we did was about um, the benefits, the medicinal benefits of wild plants. And we took them on a walk and we identified the different plants and we went through the benefits. Um, so we do this in with, with our apprentices. We do this on tours. Um, I'm interested to, to see if we can do this like at market, like put it in our salad mix. Um, but the thing with that is that people, when they're spending money on something are tend to be a little bit more apprehensive of like things that they don't know or are not familiar with, you know, like where they're gonna spend their dollar. But um, I think there's, there's a lot we can do to educate, educate people. So thank you so much for that question, James. Great, and I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Andrea's had a question for a while asking about um, indigenous engagement with the new farm. Yeah, so I saw that. So Samantha Williams is our Indigenous Life Program Coordinator. And Sam's approach is to, first of all, establish the space. And I think that, in, um, and I'm speaking on her behalf, of course, but her approach and engagement is a little bit more, uh, I think, quieter, if you will, in the sense that she's hoping to have things like have it be a safe quiet space to have um, maybe some uh, tea ceremonies with Indigenous folks or um, some, some teachings with Indigenous folks. She definitely gives a lot of tours. Um, and so if you do want to come up there, she's not necessarily running a program like the Learning Circle per se, but there's definitely a way to, to um, get involved to come up to the farm at least. Um, and then every once in a while, she gives some really cool workshops. Um, because she has some cool knowledge around the, the, the plants that she's growing. So I would say to round up uh, that question, Andrea, maybe stay tuned, but her approach is a little bit of a, a different approach than me wanting to engage and bring people up um, that have historically been excluded from urban farming. I hope that answers your question and that's what you meant. Do you want to add anything to that, Cherie? 
Yeah, I was just going to say that um, she has invited uh, a few groups up like through the Aboriginal Student Services, like most recently, um, a few folks came up to harvest the tobacco and dry the tobacco. Um, so I think she intends to do like the plants are very small right now, like, like Nicole said, it was like she's just getting the garden established. So I think once they're bigger, she'll have uh, folks come up to, to harvest and share medicines together. Great. Okay, so last question goes to Irina. It's a good one. Um, has a, I think it's a question for Nicole. Has the Black Food Sovereignty Plan um, and TMU Urban Farm reached out to Toronto high school students um, and high schools, um, suggesting there'd be a lot of students who would find the programs really exciting, huge opportunities to participate, um, introduce these concepts um, with their communities? I love that question. Thank you, Irina. Um, that's exactly um, how I envision, you know, now that we've gone through this pilot season, um, I think it was pretty successful. What I did was once a month on the third Friday from June to September, I had the, pro the learning circle with a community facilitator come in and then, you know, up to say 10 uh, participants. But I really, really think that this work needs to include youth. Um, I think that they obviously we know that they are the future, but I think that there's um, I think some opportunities to really make something like farming, perhaps or small scale farming, somewhat of uh, you know maybe a, a bit of a career, and at the very least, uh, it can help translate the food literacy piece, reclaim that food heritage piece. So I definitely want to uh, partner and reach out to various high schools and even elementary, uh, uh, the younger kids, I would welcome up there. Because I also see that um, when children are in nature and outdoors, they are, they thrive, they're happy. Uh, you rarely hear a baby crying when they're in the park, you know? Um, but so yeah, that's definitely, uh, um, and that's something that I'll look to my advisory to help me with um, maybe some advice on how to recruit and um, who to connect with. So thanks for that question. Stay tuned. And if you are one of those people, get in touch. Great, fabulous questions. We're, um, we're gonna wrap up and I wanna thank all of you, um, the, the two of you in particular for such, an, this is, I've learned so much. I really enjoy the urban farm. I enjoy the food at the farmer's market and in the cafe, but I just didn't know everything that goes on behind the scenes. So thank you so much for, in just a short period of time, really helping to educate us on all of the key aspects of what's happening. I would just really feel so proud that TMU is a leader in the space in so many different ways. Um, so thank you for being part of our series. Uh, our, this, this recording is available on the um, City Building TMU website as are all of our past recordings. And we have one more um, or two more, two, I think we have two more events in this series. It's a big series, um, TMU Urban Innovation and in Action. What we've been trying to do with this series is showcase the really cool urban innovation centers um, across campus. And we've looked at urban, energy we're going we're going to look at urban energy and urban water coming up next but in the past um, we've also looked at transportation and we've looked at um, urban analytics and today we've looked into our food and farming um, so thank you everybody um, we hope that we see you again soon thank you bye